presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, it was one of the most coveted tickets in Idaho in 2013, the chance to be on Antiques Roadshow. In a moment, Roadshow executive producer Marsha Bemko tells us why the shows from Boise will lead off the 18th season of the blockbuster series on PBS, and you'll get your first look at some of the best finds from the Gem State. That's Dialogue Next. Stay tuned. This stein my husband had me bring because he had gotten a $20 offer at the grocery store for it and he should have taken it because it was only worth $15. And I brought this thinking it was worth a lot of money and it was made in Japan and it's worth $25. But I brought this picture, didn't know anything about the author and found out it's worth two to three hundred dollars. Home run! <laughs> I brought this old violin. I found out it's worthless, but I'm selling it on my yard sale before this show airs. <laughs> and hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. You were just listening to the exuberance of people who were lucky enough to get a ticket to a taping of Antiques Roadshow in Boise. One of the highest rated shows on PBS with upwards of 8 million viewers a week, the Roadshow took over Expo Idaho in June 2013. Nearly 16,000 people put their names into a lottery to vie for the 6,000 tickets available. Those who snagged a spot were able to bring two items for appraisal with the hope they'd find out they were worth a lot more than they bought them for and maybe even make it onto TV. They trundled it all in, everything from a Chinese parade lion to toy cars, from antique clocks to stuffed animals. Now the three shows taped in Boise turned out so well that they'll lead off the 18th season of the series. And here to tell us why we made her A-list and give us a sneak peek at some of the best finds from the Boise tapings is the executive producer of Antiques Roadshow, Marsha Bemko. Marsha's been at the helm of the Roadshow for 14 of its 18 seasons. Welcome back to Boise. Well, it's great to be here. And you know, I was thinking about this in the 20 seasons of dialogue, I don't think I've ever interviewed another Marsha. Ah, only we spell it differently. <laughs> and I'll say yours is the correct spelling, just because you're my guest. Thank but. you. <laughs> and you know, it's on its way to becoming an antique name. I looked it up. The Census Bureau says the last time we even hit the top 100 names was back in 1950. Well, if I could change my name, I would, but I'm yeah. stuck with it now. <laughs> yeah, it's the same here. Maybe there'll be a revival and it'll get popular again. Um, now, back to Boise, as I understand it, our management was nagging you for quite some time to see if you could come out here. Well, yes. Um, I would say Ron, who is the head of the station yes. now, um, was a bit of a nag, <laughs> <laughs> but a friendly nag. We adore him. And he's like many of the other station yeah. presidents. We're good news for a station. Um, on top of having the three shows that we're going to produce that from your city, um, we, we boost your ratings for that. You can be sure everybody who lives around here is going to be watching starting January And probably 6th. good news for a community. Great news for a community. First of all, we're going to help you learn about your things. And um, second of all, for that public television station, we're going to let you pledge tickets, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to see five to 6,000 people that day. We're going to tape maybe 100 of them or so. Those other 4,900 or so are walking away with information that uh, not so easily found. Mm -hmm and maybe spending money in the community. Now, um, we had been asking for a while, but there were space considerations, as I understand it. No convention center here big enough for what you needed. What changed so that you, you came here? What changes is really nothing about Boise. And notice I said Boise. Yes, I learned it while I was here <laughs> last time, is we have adapted enough that once in a tour, we will go to a venue that isn't basically our requirements. Our requirements are a convention center with 80 to 100,000 square feet of space with an air wall, and then the list gets really boring. But, um, but we will, once a season, it's a lot of work for us to rejig how we lay out our set, do that, and Boise, we've been dying to get up here. We haven't been in the state, and this is an area of the country where we, we've been remiss because there aren't places to go. We had to make it happen, and we did. And it's a whirlwind when your staff comes in. We've got footage of the setup. You're on a tight schedule. This is down to a system. You bring your own 
folks, you bring your own lighting grid. As I understand it, there's 15 staff, 25 crew, some freelancers, 15 local crew, 110 volunteers, I mean, and 75 appraisers. I counted it all up. It's about 170 staff, crew, and volunteers, and 75 appraisers. Wow. Yeah, it's a village. It takes a village to make Antiques Roadshow. And, and even since, because we now go to more cities and produce more shows, we're now doing 35 episodes a year. We used to do 27. Since you gathered those numbers, I've actually, my staff is upped a little bit because you can only absorb so much into an existing staff. So it does take a village to make Roadshow. But you don't want people to wait and be annoyed and everything because they, you know, they're we do our best, yeah. and, I, and I know that we do time tickets, so you can be sure the 9 o'clock ticket people <laughs> waited less than the 5 o'clock ticket people. And that's all done by random selection because we want everyone to have a good time. If we didn't have Idaho Public Television or the other public television stations we might partner with, we couldn't do the show. It's actually 120 volunteers. We feed them, we give them an appraisal, and we give them a free shirt. And if they didn't do the show, we couldn't do the show. We make them work, and if we had to pay them, we couldn't do the show. And it's your, the people that the station recruited for us, and uh, it truly takes a village. The, on show day, as I mentioned, uh, somewhere between five and 6,000 people uh, come out of the 16,000 who tried, and uh, they, they bring an assortment, assortment of everything, it seems. <laughs> uh, what are some of the most interesting, I won't say weird or odd, but what are some of the most interesting things you've seen come through in your tenure? Well, interesting is a, is a fun yeah. word, but uh, I've seen some very odd things come. And it is, I am a mother, and, and if you ask me to pick my favorite child, ask me who my favorite child is today, and then tomorrow it changes. And it's sort of like that with appraisals. I, I could just, one of the one of my very most favorite things actually came into into Boise that I happen to like a lot, and that is this um, Babe Ruth Candy Club card. And um, but one of my most favorite things from the season, I actually see this is hard for me to do. Well, let's picking let's, favorites. Let's, let's, Let me wait, let's wait on favorites. I was thinking about odd things. Odd things. All right. The most odd thing I've ever seen, I'm embarrassed to talk about, and I can't because I'm a, a, a gentlewoman. Um, but I have seen, I think one of the oddest things was had a woman who came in, not just with her bedroom set, but with the mattress as well. She was going to make sure we could set up that whole bedroom just like it looked at home. And she lugged it all. God bless her. So for me, interesting that she would go to that kind of trouble to show us we didn't appraise the mattress. <laughs> Well, let's start getting into some of the things from Boise. First of all, why, you know, you, you were in, what, six cities for this season. Why did Boise rise to the top that you wanted to start the whole series with? You compete better than that. We were in eight cities this eight season. season. It, you know, it's hard. One of the things that pushed you up to the front was this painting that came in. Um, by we, we will show it in just a moment. Yes. Yes. So and that that's it, huh? That, that helps. Gifford painting was a big deal. Okay. Let's let's get right to that because we've got tape of this appraisal, which is quite amazing. Let's roll that. It was stored down in the basement, and then when my husband's parents passed away, he inherited it. We've had it for about 25 years but just had it stored up above the bookshelf at home and it wasn't until we watched Antiques Roadshow quite a bit that I got a little suspicious and went, I wonder if that's something that's pretty neat. I think it's pretty neat. The artist is Sanford Robinson Gifford. Now Gifford is a very, very important Hudson River artist. Really? He was considered one of the great luminist painters. Now luminism referred to the landscape painters that saw nature as sublime. Hold on to your seat. The insurance value would be about $300,000. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So there you go. That's, you gotta love that moment. Yes. I mean, what's, what, I, one of the things I love about this painting, and when this will air on January 6th, and what you will see in the rest of that appraisal is I love what our experts like Betty Krulik, who tells you she didn't even need to look at the signature. My favorite line in that painting is she says, it's signed with every stroke of the brush. She knows who that artist is. 
And we have a very unusual story about this guest. Uh, I, I, this guest, unlike 99.9% .9 of Roadshow guests, no matter what it's worth, has decided to sell that painting. Um, we're going to follow that story, and we'll see what happens with it. But uh, she, she, it, it is in a gallery, and she has commissioned it for sale. By the way, no one does that. People keep it, whether it's worth $100, 100000 500000 They tend to try and keep their things. Um, so, but, sh but they're, they're parting with it. And uh, it's rare, as I understand it, for, six figure, for a six-figure appraisal to come through. It is, and not in every city we were in this summer did all the cities have a six-figure mm -hmm. appraisal. Look at it this way. Well, about 5,000 people come to an event. Times that by two. That's 10,000. It's five to 6,000 people, so 10 to 12,000 objects. It's the truly rare, truly rare that get that kind of value. And rare is rare. If we walked around Boise and knocked on everybody's door, we wouldn't have found what we found here by gathering that day. You really want to pick somebody who, for whom there's some, a su element of surprise. It, you know, our, our slogan is discovering America's hidden treasures. We are not a show about show and tell, so we don't want the museums to bring us their great objects because they know what they have and they understand them, that's show and tell. And frankly, as much as we are about our first mission is educating and, and, and truth and honesty, we are also competing in a television environment, and it does need to be uh, educational, but yet entertaining. So um, show and tell is not very entertaining, and so we are truly about discovering America's hidden treasures. and. With 10 to 12,000 objects in the room, we don't have to settle for that. So yeah, we will look for a guest who needs something to learn. And your appraisers, let's talk about that for a moment because they, they're, they're holding all this inside. They've seen it. Mm. They're containing their excitement. They know. They're bursting. Yeah. 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 But they have to wait mm -hmm. until the reveal, so to speak, mm -hmm. and they have a code of conduct that they have to mm -hmm. follow. And if they don't follow that code of conduct, it will be their last road show. We're very, very strict about it. Um, first and foremost, uh, obviously, we need people who know what they're doing. Ideally, they're nice, because <laughs> so that they're and nice to all, all the guests too, right? who are there, good customer service <laughs> and all that. But the ethics of their business yeah. is critical. And um, we check somebody out before we add a road show expert to the roster. What's their, we'll, we'll do background checks, but we'll do gossip checks. What do the people in the business know about that person? Because we know that once we put them on the roadshow set, our viewers will trust them. And we want to be just, just be certain that, that that trust is well deserved. And you don't pay them, they pay their own way. They volunteer their yeah. time, they pay their own way. We give them lunch on Saturday, plus those 8 million viewers a week. Yeah. But yeah, they donate their time. It's an expensive summer for somebody and who comes to all eight cities. And probably the most important thing, they're not allowed to solicit while they're there. So they, you uh -huh. know, they can, a person can take their card, but they can't, you know, and sign for, up to auction this thing. And for anybody out there who's taking their objects to a local place even, anybody who's appraising your object should not offer to sell it or buy it. Um, I mean, unless it's an auction house who the market then decides. It's getting, mar <laughs> you know, auctioned off. But it's important that when you're appraising, you don't make any offers to sell. And if somebody wants somebody from Roadshow to sell that item, they have to wait till we've flown out of town. You mentioned the entertainment factor. And before we go back to another Boise clip, I just have to show one of my favorite clips. Talk about entertaining. This is a woman who had purchased a letter that Frank Sinatra wrote to the great Mike Royko, the columnist in, in uh, Chicago. There's a whole backstory, but let's listen to what happened when she found out about the value of her letter. And as such, I would estimate it at auction at at least fifteen thousand oh. dollars. And, and I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if this letter sold for more than that, because Sinatra stuff is as hot as it can get. And, uh, and it just doesn't get any better than this. Oh. So with all the provenance and your great story, oh my it's God. just such a great piece. I was so, <laughs> so happy that you brought it in today. Oh, gee, I, I'm going to faint. <laughs> I'm going to faint. I really... Are you all right? <laughs> oh, oh, yes, give me a seat. Oh, man. Are they kidding me? Did you all hear that? Did you all hear that? Yes. Oh, and that. <laughs> 
offered me $100 for it. You can't have it for $100. I just love that because in Me addition too. to the appraisal, the number, there is her passion. Then you see the crew as well, which is part of the whole story. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe you have to have an ambulance. Uh, She's excited. Waiting by. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that moment, her story about how she got the letter, how her family yeah. had bought it for her. Um, this is a producer's dream, by the way. She has the best reaction of that season. Um, that's a clip that I never tire of looking at. She is thrilled. Um, you, I have, we have a clip from this season that's I, what I would say is the best reaction of the season as well. Yeah. And it's the uh, Madam C.J. Walker book. And, um, and that's not in Boise, that's in another one of the cities. That's in another cities. city coming up, yeah. but there is, oh, there's someone who does it for you. But frankly, if you're, if you're watching this, please do let out your emotions when you come to Antiques Roadshow because something like that doesn't happen every year even. And just briefly, Madam C.J. Walker, and we'll, we'll show some footage of that, is um, she was an African-American woman, self-made, first self-made female millionaire mm -hmm. in this country, as I that's understand right. it. And, and the reaction of the woman who has it is, is priceless. It's totally priceless. Uh, it was a, a guest who got that book as a, a gift from a friend. No clue <laughs> that it's worth it. quite a, five figures of money there. It's a $10,000 book. While I'm thinking of it, there aren't, I, I haven't noticed that many African Americans or other ethnicities um, as guests on, or people coming to Roadshow. Is that a, something you're working on? It is something we're working on. As a matter of fact, what we do in every community, and we did it here as well, is we uh, work with the station to do outreach with uh, 200 tickets to look for uh, diverse distribution so that we can have more diversity on Roadshow. The challenge for, in the world of antiques anyways, not for our guests, is that for generations it's been a very white male world. Mm -hmm. And so even on Roadshow set, by the way, the men outnumber the women two to one. Interesting. Um, but it is a challenge and we are always looking for creative ways to, to get more people into the fold. We've all got something we're interested in. It'll and happen. It'll, it'll happen. happen. Um, by the way, no matter what we're interested in, if it follows the rule of thumb, it's not worth a lot of money, just yeah. so you know. Most things, are, <laughs> most things are sentimental in value. Exactly. Let's take a look at another clip from Boise. I love this as well. This is another uh, appraisal of a letter with a, with a story behind it. Let's take a look. Eccles is saying, I'm 33 years old, and I haven't had much education. I was raised by a guardian. I only went to one year of school when I was 14 years old, learned a little arithmetic. So I'm writing to you as a fellow Virginian because now I'm a fairly successful businessman, enough to support my family, but I want to know what books I should read to further my education. And I'm writing to you because I know that you're a knowledgeable and worldly guy. And Jefferson, here in this letter, takes the time to reply. It's a wonderful letter. If this letter came up for auction, it would fetch from thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars because of the contents. Wow. Well, maybe I shouldn't keep it in the sideboard. <laughs> maybe not. So again, a letter signed by Thomas Jefferson to an ancestor of this woman who was asking him for assistance on what books he should read. I think it's an interesting insight into Jefferson too. He has, it, it, you get to he gives some advice about why he doesn't like one book versus another in the political views of that book, and that kind of history that Roadshow shares with the nation is priceless. This isn't documented anywhere else. We are often the first documenters. Historians are interested often in what we uh, have talked about. I mean, even when you look back uh, over the years of Antiques Roadshow, the very famous JFK photographer, Cecil Stoughton, no other organization has an interview with Cecil Stoughton. We are in a fortunate position where everybody, whether you're famous or not, <laughs> is interested in what they own, especially family things. How did this happen? Where did it come from? And very often we can answer those questions. And things have feet. I mean, they do. between the mail service and just people carrying it around, you can get a letter from Jefferson there. Uh, let's look at another clip. You mentioned it already. It's a Babe Ruth candy card that somebody yes. ordered through the mail. And let's take a, take a look at that appraisal. This 
is an item that belonged to my father. He would be 100 years old this year. It was kept by my grandmother, and when her estate was distributed, this little box of all kinds of things that she kept was brought to our family. In the realm of Babe Ruth collectibles, this is one of the rarer items. Oh, it is. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, prior to today, there was only three of these known to exist. Oh, my goodness. And this one here today being the fourth to surface. This item today at auction would sell for between $1,500 and $2,000. Wow. Well, I'm happy I brought it today. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised it's so rare. She's pretty contained, but um, you just never know what you have. Maybe now I can know. explain to my mom why I've saved, you know, like all my wacky, <laughs> wacky packs, <laughs> stickers from the 1970s or something. But I was kind of that way too. I collected, not, not for uh, value, but just, I don't know, just interest. Generally, that's what it is, by the way. People, I mean, unless you're in the business, collect for sentimental reasons yeah. or because they love something. Like maps, I love and maps. And then they yeah. bump into value. Mm -hmm. um, this is a card. Most people's sentimental value is so great. As I've said, it doesn't matter what it's worth. They can't part with it unless they have great need or something. It's just, they can't. They can't and let what it go. do you like so much about this? You mentioned it at the top of the show. I love, first of all, that it's one of four. Now. There was one. There were only three in existence before. When there were it's, tons sent out, but most yeah, people tons. probably just threw them away. What they explained during the appraisal is the process of how you got this Babe Ruth Candy Club card. It wasn't just you had yeah. to mail in and it had to come back, and and so it wasn't for the lazy. And then let's face it, where are your baseball cards? Uh, where are my baseball cards? They get thrown out. Things get people don't save these things, and just how easily that could have been in a stack of worthless cards and chucked. I love that it's been rescued. I love that she was curious. And for that little tiny card, $1,500 to $2,000, and it probably will exceed that, where they're usually conservative and it's one of four, that blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. Well, while we have time, let's take a, a look at one last uh, appraisal from Boise, from the tapings there. And this is somebody who had a, a plate over their stove for quite some time hanging because uh -huh. they kids liked the way it looked and happened to be done by a famous artist. It's been in our family since about 1970. We bought it in Rhode Island. Didn't even realize it was a Picasso until about five years ago. I have to admit <laughs> that it hung over the stove in the kitchen and all of our kids love the smiley face. Would you be surprised that an auction value in today's market probably on the conservative side, would be in the range of $10,000 to $15,000. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> ah, that's a Medora plate. We've seen other Picasso Medora. You gotta love her reaction. It's honest. I would feel like that if I were her. Somebody, you just told me this is worth that kind of money? I'd be grabbing that appraiser. I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to believe that the, pot, the, the plate that was hanging above gathering grease is now worth five figures. And uh, to my memory, she paid around $50 to $100 for that. The appraiser is priceless as well in his reaction. Yes. I love you too. <laughs> so you, you mentioned you've seen other Medora, obviously. Yes. Um, what, what, when somebody comes and talks to you and makes the pitch, Marsha, let's go with this, and you've already seen something like mm. that before, how do you decide? Not easily. It's hard. Um, frankly, there are some ones that are just gimmies. The Madam C.J. Walker book, the, the Gifford painting. The, the, your, my children would pick this. <laughs> um, and, but most of them aren't that easy. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of things over the years, so we, a lot goes into that decision. It's not an exact list, list or an exact science. One of the things you've already mentioned is that does the guest have something to learn? Or is it yet another Tiffany butterfly, a dragonfly lamp? We're sick of them. So it's even, everybody knows what they're worth now. So a lot goes into, we've got uh, 18 years, of, we're, we're starting to broadcast season 18, so 18 years under our belts, and we're not going to do the same things over and over again. Um, and so we just want it to be great television where you learn something. We love things like the Jefferson letter, where you learn something about Jefferson. Love that. So you have about, what, 60 hours of tape that you come back with from a venue that you have to condense into three hours? At least, So yes. that's, what, 80 to 90 yes. appraisals that have to come and down it, to it, how many it, per show? About? It's about, from the, from the multi-cams, about 15 per show, plus the single camera appraisals, about another half dozen of those in each show. And do keep in mind, I don't know the date yet, but when we know, this Idaho PTV will know as well, 
you will have a little bit more coming mm. because we make two hours called oh, Junk in the Trunk. And in the Junk in the Trunk, we've been to eight cities, we will use the things we couldn't squeeze into the three hours of that city, make it into these two hours. So after these January broadcasts, sometime later in the year, um, watch for more from Boise because there'll be more. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that when you go to a city, you also, I mean, it's as much about education mm -hmm. as these valuations, and you pick a place, a historic place mm -hmm. in a city to go. And in Boise, it was the Egyptian theater, classic revival, Egyptian revival mm -hmm. uh, theater, and you displayed some beautiful jewelry. Mm -hmm. Egyptian tell, revival jewelry. Tell me, tell me about why... Um, I mean, you have limited time in a show. Mm -hmm. You could be putting a couple more appraisals in there, a couple mm -hmm. more reveals. Sure. Why is it important to you to have that historical section in there? We need a sense of place. Where in the world are we? We also want to be able to talk about objects in a way they won't come in. So we can do comparisons there. We can show how Egyptian jewelry evol evolved. There are, or we also wear the old Idaho pen. And so we can talk about those kind of items in a way that you just won't see them walk in that way. But for us, it's really about a sense of place, and um, the Egyptian theater is one of the best places we're in this summer. It's a great place. As we wrap m up, Marcia, I'd like to look at a clip from another city in the 18th series, and it represents, I think, the future. You paid $2. Yes. What do you think it might be worth today? 150 bucks. 150 bucks? I think it's worth 150. I think it's more than 150. Today, if your Albert Newhoist watercolor came to an auction, it would probably sell for between $1,000 and $1,500. Whoa. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> He's like a cartoon <laughs> character come alive. I really I adored this kid. I met him. I picked this. And uh, this is the real deal, this kid. This kid's a picker. And I've met children before whose parents are plying them with the, you know, just filling them with what to tell the producer. This is the real deal. He's pushing his father into these auctions, and um, he's going to be a roadshow appraiser. I want him to keep in touch with me, give him another few decades and a couple decades, and if that interest stays like that, he'll be back. He's gonna, he's, this kid isn't going away. Yeah, I adore him. He's the future. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for explaining a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes at Antiques Roadshow. And, you know, here's our collector's item for you. Every guest gets a dialogue mug. So thank you. Very few in circulation. As far as the rarity factor, I'll just have to go with other guests getting it, but I'm good with it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Marsha. <laughs> You've been listening to Marsha Bemko. She's the executive producer of Antiques Roadshow on PBS. I'm Marsha Franklin. And thanks for tuning in. Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.